Cherbs, this is Yayoi Kusama's All the Eternal Love I Have for Pumpkins from 2016. It's one of Kusama's famous infinity rooms that, with the help of some well-placed mirrors, seems to display an infinite landscape of yellow pumpkins spotted with her signature polka dots. If you are lucky enough to have experienced one of her infinity rooms, you know the reactions that people have to them. They freak out. You'll hear a series of giggles and gaps. You'll also hear a few expletives and expressions of joy. A, what is this? Perhaps followed by a, this is awesome. You'll also, of course, hear the shutter of selfie cameras. These infinity rooms are exceptionally good at producing these types of reactions. These experiences of awe and excitement and joy. They knock you off balance and then they steady you on a different foundation. In short, they're a religious experience. And I mean that. These rooms and the work of Yayoi Kusama generally give people a religious experience. I guess I'll need to explain myself. Okay, so first let's start by defining what I mean by a religious experience. In her brilliant book, The Case for God, Karen Armstrong argues that religion should not be thought of as a set of beliefs, but a set of actions. The earliest mythologies and stories we, as humans, created in order to understand our experience weren't just stories. They were acted out and performed in various ways. The stories were linked to performances, to rituals. They came with choreographies and scripts. Motions and costumes transformed the stories into an actual lived experience. Armstrong makes the argument that, without rituals, myths make no sense and would remain as opaque as a musical score, which is impenetrable to most of us until interpreted instrumentally. She goes on to conclude that religion, therefore, was not primarily something that people thought of, but something they did. So this argument might take some readjusting of what you think religion is. People need to put aside any assumptions that religion is a set of beliefs and definitions passively accepted. Thomas Aquinas, the Christian theologian and philosopher, argued that you cannot define God. You can, however, have different ways of thinking about God. This is another way of emphasizing that belief in a god or gods is more of a methodology than a list of statements to be blindly accepted. It's a thinking practice more than a dogma. So the thing you do rather than believe may just be thinking, or more specifically, actively pursuing different mental states beyond the comfortable domains of language and reason. Another thing to get out of the way before we discuss Kusama's work directly is that there is a strong evidence that all art forms have their roots in religious ritual. Dance, music, sculpture, etc. So in some ways, all art is a religious experience. But let's keep this focused on the visual arts for now, and then Kusama specifically. The earliest visual art we know of appears in Alaska caves. The paintings here include lots of animals, and there is evidence that these sketches were drawn over and over repeatedly, presumably as part of a ritual. The artists were, it seems, trying to understand their relationship to the natural world and the animal kingdom through a visual arts practice. Ritual is an interesting thing. Think of funerals or weddings. They exist in different forms in different cultures all over the world. Death and love are two very difficult concepts to understand. We can throw all the logic we want at them, but the lived human experience of both can't be captured in a syllogism. We have had to build rituals around them, something choreographed to give us the space to confront these experiences. To quote Karen Armstrong again, seriously, this book is great. Get it? This is not a sponsorship. Just read the thing. When discussing the ritual of animal sacrifice and the suffering of animals in early human rituals and life, Karen Armstrong writes that one of the functions of ritual is to evoke an anxiety in such a way that the community is forced to confront it and control it. During a funeral, we are forced to confront the anxiety created by the loss. During a wedding, we are forced to confront the anxiety created by love. There are many human experiences that are overwhelming and seem to require the structure, community, and participation of a ritual in order to process the ineffable and endure. When logic fails, when language fails, when our own ability to envision or imagine the future without somebody fails, ritual and religion step in. They exist to help us find meaning in our experience. So in order to convince you that Kusama's infinity rooms are a religious experience, I'll take these two ideas one by one. First, that religious experiences are less about belief and more about action and participation. And second, the purpose they serve is to help us find meaning when the experience of being human is overwhelming and our other tools fail us. Walking into an infinity room puts you in a strange mental space. The mirrors mess with your sense perception well enough to make you question the reliability of those senses. And we have an unreasonable faith in our power of perception. 
Our language reflects this in the way that we talk about sight. Seeing is believing, picks or it didn't happen, etc. So when that faith is shaken, it provokes anxiety. When we look out into an infinity room, we don't have a mental model to reconcile what we're seeing with what we know to be true. So this knocks us off balance. It puts us in a space where we don't trust our senses. Additionally, by confronting infinity, we start to question our own logic as well. The infinity rooms put our minds in a place beyond rationality. The experience of these rooms, I think, is similar to the realization that the Pythagorean cults had when they stumbled upon irrational numbers. They could prove they exist. They proved it over and over again in different ways, and yet they couldn't fully comprehend the infinite, non-repeating nature of these numbers. We can prove the existence of pi, for example. It shows up in mathematics all the time, and yet we have to live with the fact that we can never know it fully. We cannot know its last digit. We cannot put it in a box. We can't even build something capable of fully comprehending pi in its full articulation. It can't be put on a thumb drive. It can show up in our equations, but it's beyond our comprehension. This might be one of those ways of thinking about God that Thomas Aquinas talked about. Or a way about thinking about human life. I'm thinking about the way John Green uses Cantor's proof that some infinities are smaller than other infinities in his book The Fault in Our Stars. When we put ourselves in one of Kusama's infinity rooms, we are putting ourselves in a space to safely dwell in the gaps and ambiguities that lie at the limits of our sense perception, reason, and imagination. And that fulfills the mission of a ritual. By participating, we are actively placing ourselves in a meditative space and thinking in an unconventional and, to transition to part two, an oftentimes uncomfortable way. The rooms provoke anxiety and then force us to confront it. The specific anxiety that confronting infinity rooms provokes is our smallness. When placed anywhere on an infinite landscape, you realize that you are not the center because the infinite has no center. Her work has explored this from early in her career. Some of her first well-reviewed pieces were large paintings of infinity nets that seemed to have no center. Critics loved this for the very reason that they disrupted the way they visually tried to read paintings. Additionally, Kusama covers much of her work in polka dots, and when those dots appear, they cover everything indiscriminately. Nothing is spared. When this decentering of the viewer and the indiscriminate polka dot network covers her work, she calls the result obliteration, and more specifically, self obliteration. Her famous obliteration room had participants place colorful polka dots all over a white room until everything in it seemed to fade into one jumbled mess of color. The individuality of the objects in the room were consumed and obliterated, subsumed into something universal and inevitable. The realization that you are part of something much larger than yourself, that you are not the center of the world's narrative, and that you are a small dot among an infinite number of small dots is horrifying. It's depressing, but in a work of Kusama's, it's freeing. It will make you giggle. Her work will put you at the limits of what you feel comfortable with and then let you be there safely and joyfully. We have these ways of building meaning in the universe that allow us to feel secure. We use logic to put things in order, language to communicate and share ideas, imagination and memory to help us center our lives in the past and future, but all these ways of thinking have points of failure. Optical illusions make us question our sense perception. Confronting infinity makes us question our rationality. There are experiences beyond language's ability to communicate. And those failures breed uncertainty. Uncertainty breeds anxiety. Kusama's work confronts the resulting anxieties directly while giving us a space to process them. To quote Karen Armstrong again, As meaning-seeking creatures, men and women fall very easily into despair. They have created religion and works of art to help them find value in their lives, despite all the dispiriting evidence to the contrary. Kusama's infinity rooms do all of that. They help us confront fears at the center of our humanity and find value in our position in the universe. The self and the ego is obliterated in her work. That faith we have in all our meaning-making tools is crushed, and then we're shown the beauty of what remains. I'll leave you with one more quote from Karen Armstrong. We are at our most creative when we do not cling to our selfhood, but are prepared to give ourselves away. And if you like this content, please consider subscribing. I put out a new video every month. Thank you for watching.